You're very welcome, everybody, to this interview, uh, which I'm conducting with Crawford Gribben. Uh, Crawford is um, a lecturer at Queen's University, Belfast, and is the author of a number of books, including his latest one, which I'm going to hold up with the camera, and hopefully everybody can notice. So this is The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland. It comes from Oxford University Press. I reviewed it recently myself for the Catholic Herald and found it to be a very lucid and clear and readable overview of Irish Christian history, in which I learned things I hadn't uh, previously known and which I was reminded of things I had forgotten. And it was just kind of good to get it all in one place uh, place in a kind of, uh, you know, pacey way, uh, covers a lot of ground, covers it quickly, um, doesn't really pause for breath, which is a good thing. Um, so I'd highly recommend it as a kind of one volume Christian, uh, sorry, history of Christian Ireland, written in your case, um, I'm, I'm not going to say from a Protestant perspective, uh, but you yourself um, are Protestant, um, but, what, but I didn't if, if I hadn't known, I wouldn't have known uh, that it was written from that perspective. So um, it's very objective, I think, from that point of view, and I hope if I was able to write a similar history, unless it was setting out to be, uh, setting out to be polemical, I'd be able to do the same thing. But I'm going to drop you in the deep end, Crawford, and ask you, so we've had one and a half thousand years of Christian history in Ireland, and we'd go back and look at certain episodes. Um, but one and a half thousand years forward from the arrival of Christianity in Ireland. Has the Christian presence in this country been a net gain or a net loss for the country overall? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's the ultimate question, David, isn't it? We can do all the sort of descriptive work that we like, but uh, uh, unless we can know whether this was actually a good thing or not, um, none of the rest of it really makes much sense. Well, I mean, as, as you hinted there, I, I am a Christian, so I'm predisposed to believe that uh, Christianity has done good things, or Christians or Christian churches have done good things uh, on, in the history of this island. We, we don't need to be reminded of the many terrible things that have happened, and uh, the book does go in to describe a number of those. But I think fundamentally, what, what makes the arrival of Christianity so important in this island is that it is the arrival of a message of how people who are far away from God can be brought near to God through Jesus Christ. And that, you know, whatever else Christians have done, uh, you know, that, that has to be significant. I think on top of that, you can, you can think about how the arrival of the Christian message brought people together, gave them a common identity as, as Irish men and Irish women. Um, it, uh, the, the Christian community, as it began to emerge, established monasteries, which were obviously very important in terms of education, um, uh, in healthcare, and, and, and so on. Um, undoubtedly, while there may have been a sort of a shock of arrival, uh, the, the religious culture that Christianity replaced, even if it didn't replace it completely, um, was a religious culture that would be much more alien to um, 21st century life than the culture that the Christians created would have been. And by that, I mean, while it's very difficult, I think, to know the exact details of religious practice before the early fifth century, I mean, it seems clear that um, as the, the exhibition of bog bodies in a major Dublin museum indicates, it mm -hmm. seems quite clear that, uh, you know, the, the evidence seems to be quite clear that it, it was not always an especially pleasant place to be. I think that, you know, the sort of Celtic twilight movement that began in the early or late 19th, early 20th century, and its modern day successors has somewhat sentimentalized the, uh, the, the, the older uh, forms of religious practice. But I mean, I think it's clear from archeological discoveries that it was not necessarily um, sweetness and light. It wasn't necessarily a message of loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and it certainly wasn't a message about how to know God through Jesus Christ, which is the big message of Christianity itself. So overall, I mean, it's it's a complicated question. I think that there are obviously some, you know, really, really terrible things that have happened, um, either done by Christians or in the name of the church. Um, but I think for, for those reasons, fundamentally, for, for the discovery of God through Jesus Christ, 
I think it's overall um, a, a positive, a positive story. I mean, Kel said human sacrifice, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, those bog bodies, there's a debate about what those bog bodies in the Dublin museums mean, mm. uh, but it seems to be some kind of ritual sacrifice of a young man, um, typically a young man dying on behalf of his people in order to restore fertility to the land. That seems to be essentially what's going on. I mean, if you read Julius Caesar's account of the conquest of Gaul, he describes in some detail what he thought uh, the, the religion of the Druids was all about, and he describes how Druids train, it took them 20 years to train, both men and women could become Druids. Um, the, the, their whole religious practice was based on these kind of sacred mysteries. But fundamental to that religion, he claims, um, was the construction of giant wicker men mm. uh, who'd be filled with human beings and with animals and then set alight. And that, that's, you know, he, he says that's part of um, the, the, the religion of the Celts. Whether that happened in Ireland, we don't know, but certainly we do know from the discovery of these bog bodies uh, that a, a, a different kind of human sacrifice was definitely taking place. There was a horror film from the early 70s with Christopher Lee called The Wicker Man. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It was filmed actually just down the road where I grew up in Ayrshire. Okay, Calais. so there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah, I remember at the end of that movie and it was just horrifying. You know what happens to poor all I think was Edward Woodward was playing the investigating cop for some murder. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like I've been reading a number of books in the last couple of years um, about the Christian legacy uh, in general in the West. Um, one is called Dominion by Tom Holland. And Tom Holland is probably what he described as a kind of Christian agnostic, by which I mean Christian sympathetic, but doesn't believe the metaphysical claims. Uh, there's a fellow called Larry Seedentop, uh, formerly of Oxford University, one called um, uh, Inventing the Individual. And there's a more recent one called The Weirdest People in the World by a Harvard anthropologist. And weird stands for Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic. And it kind of charts how Western people are so, have become so individualistic compared to the rest of the world. And it puts it all down to Christianity um, and how the West developed is largely because of Christianity. But one of the things that struck me when the um, uh, pandemic broke out, because you're reading about Wuhan, and how it broke out there. And the first ever hospital in Wuhan was founded by Christian missionaries. So I think a lot of the Christian legacy we take for granted, we think like hospitals would have simply arisen in the natural course of the development of any civilization. But it turns out that's just not the case at all. Um, so the Christian injunction, um, the, you know, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, yeah. look after the sick, which might've been happening at a clan level, doesn't seem to be happening above that. Um, so this and the welfare state is part of the Christian legacy, all taken for granted now, and we, and we seem to think that would have happened anyway, but actually not necessarily. And yeah. because again, if you look at other civilizations, um, they weren't developing many of these things. Uh, so I think we can overlook this, but let's just go back um, more or less to the start. Um, and can you describe why um, St. Patrick I mean, even though, Christi like, like even though Christianity didn't take total root in Ireland at this time, it began to take root in a pretty big way. Why do you think that's so? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, I think that's a really good question, David. And we, I don't know that we necessarily were able to answer it very clearly. And that's because Patrick is one of a tiny number of early Christians who really explains what he's doing, what he's about, what he believes and so on. And, you know, he tells us in uh, his confession there, that um, you know, he, he's baptized thousands of people and that, that many hundreds of the, 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 the younger people of the leading families in the island have been, have been you know, become uh, chaste virgins for Christ, monks or nuns, um, variously. So it's, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the number of baptisms, if we take that for granted, if we take that at face value, that there was a huge impact uh, within, the, within the fifth century. Why people became Christians, I think we don't really know. I think there, there, there was probably, there's probably a sense that they were moving from a religious culture, from one religious culture to another. Um, but the new religious culture that they were moving to, in some ways, I think had a very difficult sell in Ireland because Patrick, Palladius initially, Patrick that followed him and, and those who came with Patrick were moving with a, a message that, that whose reputation was bound up 
with the Roman Empire, you know, for the previous, you know, really since the end of the fourth century, um, the, the Christian religion had become a dominant force in the Roman Empire. But in 410, Rome gets sacked. And, you know, the, the Roman army is moving out of, of Britain back to take part in the civil wars that really herald the end of the Roman, of, of that phase of the Roman Empire. And it just seems to me that, uh, you know, when, when these early missionaries came to Ireland, they, they were coming with a very, very big ask, which was to ask people to move away from a religious culture that had made sense of life in this Ireland uh, for, I don't know, five, six thousand years, something like that. Mm -hmm move away from sacred sites that their, their parents, grandparents and so on had venerated, to move away from religious customs that everybody took for granted, and to adopt an entirely new way of looking at the world, an entirely new way of thinking about um, who you were as an individual, what a community could become. But fundamentally, I think, a whole new, a whole new way of thinking about what a god is and what a god can do. And instead of the sort of rapacious... Um, difficult deities uh, of, of the sort of Celtic pantheon. They're being presented with a, a, a god, you know, who loves the world, uh, who, who's sending a son to be its saviour. And, you know, it's, it's a completely different kind of message. And I think, you know, when you look at Patrick's confession, you get this really vibrant sense of intense spirituality and intense commitment and also intense sacrifice. You know, he writes about how he's been brutalised and even enslaved when he went into the west of Ireland, um, you know, he, he, you know, he, he was living at times in, in, in fear of death. But yet what, what drives this is uh, this very, I think, very moving and uh, almost visceral um, sense of encounter with God. And also this really dominating expectation that Jesus Christ is about to return. And that the, you know, the, the evidence for that is that the gospel has gone to the very ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. In this case, you know, the, the westernmost island um, known at that point, with the exception perhaps of Iceland. Um, so, you know, I, I, th I think there's there's lots of things. It's very difficult. I think it's very difficult to know how ordinary, why ordinary people were converting. But I think we can get a sense from Patrick's writing of his, of some of the drivers that were pushing that mission forward and the really extraordinary commitment that he put into spreading that message. Um, can you describe... Um early Irish monasticism and why it was so successful? Yeah, so the, well, one, of the, one of the things that makes the Irish church really distinct in the early centuries is this very strong monastic culture. Um, elsewhere in the continent, um, church oversight, uh, church organisation had been um, routinized, I suppose, by the appointment of bishops in major urban centres. Um, in Ireland, there were no major urban centres, and so the church had to look to a different strategy to organize itself <clears throat> and, to, and to provide for you know, pastoral training and um, theological training, pastoral care, health care, education, and so on and so on. And so, you know, the, the, the monasteries then become this really, really important laboratory of ideas, opinions, um, art, creativity, um, health care, and, 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 and so on. And, you know, these, these monasteries, they seem to be based often in sites that are already sites of, of some significance. Um, in the older cosmology. Uh, a lot of them are based at borders between kingdoms. There's about 150 different kingdoms in Ireland in the fifth century. Um, the, uh, these monastic communities seem to be based strategically, um, almost as if to negotiate relationships mm. between kingdoms. And then of course, you've got another form of monasticism that takes off a little bit later um, when um, monks um, who may prefer a, a quieter life are heading off to places like Skellig Michael, you know, to, to be um, to be inaccessible and there to give their lives to prayer uh, and and um, other kinds of scriptural uh, scholarship. But the, 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 the monasteries, I think, in Ireland become really, really important. Uh, they're associated with various founding fathers or mothers. Um, the uh, Columba network, there's a network that's based very much in Patrick, another one that's based around um, Kildare, uh, around the cult of St. Bridget. Uh, and these become really important um, networks for pushing the message of Christ far beyond the shores of this island. Columba famously, is, uh, whose 1500th birthday we celebrate this year, establishes uh, a monastery on Iona, from which the Iona Institute takes its name. Mm -hmm. And uh, and from Iona, you know, sets out to conquer Scotland 
with the gospel. And, you know, Iona may look like really remote today, this tiny island off the off another island, the island of Mull. But in, in the fifth, sixth century, it's, it's really strategically located because it's right on a major sea highway. And also it's ideally located for sailing up that sequence of lochs up the Great Glen that takes us to modern day Inverness. And if you go right the way up there and drive up to Rosher, east of Ross, and visit Port Mahomet, uh, you'll see there archaeological remains of a Columban monastery, a very small um, monastic community, probably smaller than most of the houses uh, that we have in, in Ireland at the moment. But that, that, that becomes a, a little base for working out uh, in a life of prayer and service and, and study and, and worship. Um, of working out how Christianity is going to impact the Picts. And, you know, we know nothing about the Picts, hardly. Uh, we've got archaeological remains. We don't know how to interpret them. We don't know what their swirls mean. Mm -hmm. Another completely pre-literate culture. Um, but yet we know from archaeological digs at Port Mahomet and elsewhere that Christianity really becomes intertwined with that culture and, and begins to give, give it some visible expression. Other, other monks, just uh, on that, other monks mm -hmm. um, set up bases even further north, Shetland, Faroe, um, even Iceland. And uh, th there are stories in the, the Viking sagas that when the first Vikings arrive in Iceland, they discover it's already been populated by Irish monks who are known in the mythology as, as the Papa, or as the Fathers. So they're everywhere. Yeah, no, it's amazing, all right. And um, like, um, what tough and hardy people they must have been to do what they did um, and the risks to life that they were taking all the time, the kind of deep commitment involved and the amazing legacy that they left behind. So if we go back to my first question about, you know, was it a net loss or a net gain? I mean, like even the worst critics of Christianity in Ireland would accept that the monasteries were an amazing achievement and uh, spread their influence far and wide and were you know, centres of learning and yeah. kept a lot of learning and that, again, even people who have otherwise rejected Christianity uh, would regard as important. Now, of course, the monasteries in Ireland are developing in their own way and pretty independently of Rome. And that's probably partly because, well, we were outside the Roman Empire and we have been doing our own thing for a very long time and we continue to do this. So describe the process by which um, Irish Christianity becomes more Roman, if you like, and more mainstream. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. That's a question that historians have really debated uh, for, for many centuries. The question of whether the early Irish church was independent of Rome or not. I, I don't think it's really possible to say that any national church is independent of Rome in this period, uh, because the, 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 these national churches believed in being Catholic, small c, let's say, small c Catholic, mm. they believed in doing things together and they had a sense that they were part of a, a, a world, well, a, you know, a, a continental wide, um, an international Christian community that wanted to walk together. And I think that's, that's a very important thing to recognise. But even recognising that, we still also have to balance against that, the fact that the Irish church had a different way, for example, of calculating the date of Easter. It had different monastic um, networks than those that were being promoted uh, on the continent and so on. And really from the seventh century onwards, there's a real pressure uh, on the Irish church to, to have it adopt the liturgical calendar of the European church. And it does take time. And different parts of the Irish church, I think, move towards that um, European model faster than others. And in fact, the Columba network is the is the slowest of the of the Irish monastic networks to adopt that European dating, and so for maybe about hundred years in the the six hundreds, early seven hundreds, for maybe about hundred years, you've got two different liturgical calendars in play in the Irish Church. You've got the the European one, and you've also got the one that was traditionally Irish, but becomes increasingly unfashionable until uh, eventually uh, even the the, the Columba network uh, gives it up. So I think that's the first major thing. The second major attempt to Catholicise with a capital C, the Irish Church, 
comes really in the late 11th, 12th century when St. Malachy comes back from a visit he has made to Rome. He's met Bernard de Clairvaux. You know, he's been really inspired. He's an Archbishop of Armagh, right? Yeah, Archbishop mm. of Armagh. And he's, he's really inspired by what he has seen of the glory of, <laughs> of Christendom. And, he, and, you know, he comes back to Ireland and he's a little bit embarrassed by the kind of um, ad hoc nature, improvised, idiosyncratic nature of so many uh, influential parts of the Irish Church, and he sets out then to to advance the what's called the Gregorian Reformation. If, if, sorry, Crawford, if I can say, there's a constant pattern there which you're describing in Irish history, which is that we often consider ourselves to be backward and kind of outside the European mainstream, and then over time there's various attempts to make us quote unquote less backward, and in a sense that's an early attempt. Well, I'm not going to use the word overcompensation. Uh, I'll, I'll let someone else use yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I mean, I think that's true. And, and in, in many ways, it's ironic, I think, that Malachi, if, if I remember correctly, so Malachi is the first Irish Christian to be um to, to, to be um to, to become a saint. Um, but but he's also one of the one of the what one of the most um, critical of the church that he represents so really it's, it's the early 12th century that you know that he sets out really to eradicate what had been typical of Irish Christianity up to that point point. Um, so the old monastic orders are suppressed European orders the Cistercians and so on are introduced and um, that of course you know leads to some difficulties when orders like the Knights Templar or the Knights Hospitaller mm -hmm. um, begin to, 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 to take up um, positions um, but that 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 occurs, I think, largely as a consequence yeah, I'm, of the I mean, Norman invasion, which yeah. is immediately in the back of that as well. I was saying in the review of your book in the Catholic Herald that um, there's a sense in which, um, and I know this is a little bit simplistic, um, that the Catholic Church in those days was a little bit analogous to the EU today, um, and so I, and so Ireland was kind of semi-attached. To this EU, if you like, um, and um, you know, Rome wanted the church to become more centralized and more uniform. Um, in the same way, maybe Brussels wants you know European laws to become more uniform, and um, you get this kind of federal system, uh, which is kind of growing all the time. I'm not saying this to either um, have a go at the EU or support the EU. I'm just kind of saying this is kind of factual thing. That it seems again through history to have these been these kind of centralizing and decentralizing tendencies, and the centralizing tendencies once upon a time were centered on Rome, and now today they're centered on uh, Brussels, and of course, um, Britain in the past broke with Rome, and then it broke with Brussels. They kind of do its own thing. Um, so you see all kinds of interesting echoes the whole time happening through history in various kind of ways, and. Um, uh, I just find that kind of interesting. Uh, let's fast forward a bit more um, and the arrival of the English in Ireland, who were obviously Catholic, um, but then later we end up with a Protestant power uh, represented by England. And what do you think was the impact of um, Protestantism when it first arrives uh, upon this country? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, the answer, I suppose, is quite simple. It made virtually no impact at all, except in legislation and in the exercise of power. So, um, you know, the, the, I suppose there's, there's two major attempts to reform the church in Ireland. One of those, a Catholic attempt in the 12th century, um, led by Henry II of England, um, which which largely fails, you know, that the Irish church continues to do things its own way, continues to have married clergy, for example, right the way up to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. So under Henry VIII in the 16th century, there's a second attempt to reform the Irish church. It also fails, although ironically, I think you could possibly say that the Irish church only becomes Catholic when Henry VIII is trying to make it Protestant. But that's a kind of a paradox we could maybe talk about at some other point. But, you know, the, um, the Protestant Reformation fails in Ireland very, very quickly. Um, it fails because there is no real effort to persuade anyone that the Protestant understanding of the New Testament message is more accurate than the one that, that, that's also being offered uh, by, by the, the Irish Church, by, by, um, 
uh, the Irish Catholic Church. And so there's a, there's a survey taken at the very start of the 17th century. This is now about 100 years, well, 80 years after the Reformation begins. A mm. survey is taken. And th this survey calculates that in the previous 80 years, only around 120 Irish-born Catholics have converted to the new Reformed faith. And all the other tens of thousands of people in Ireland who are Protestants have arrived there, largely during that 80-year period either in plantation schemes uh, or through an army uh, or, you know, through some other effort. So the, the Protestant Reformation fails. And in some ways, um, you know, speaking as someone who might you know, recognise that, that that could have been a strength, uh, one of the reasons I think most importantly why it fails is because there's no attempt to provide Bibles in a language that anyone can understand. Uh, the, 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 com the first complete Bible, I think, is published in Irish in the 1680s, that's about 150 years mm -hmm. after the Irish Reformation. If you contrast that with the Reformation in Germany that just takes off um, so quickly, uh, you know, the, the, the German Bible is provided within what, five or six years of Luther nailing his 95 theses to mm -hmm. the castle door. It's completely different here. And I think one of the reasons why it fails is because there's no real attempt to persuade anybody. There's a big attempt to force people, to corral people, to contain people, but there's no real attempt to persuade people. And I think that becomes a, a, a big theme in the next couple of centuries. Yeah, you say in the book as well that uh, that Catholicism in Ireland was in relatively good health at the time. So yeah. maybe people just weren't as ready to give it up as in some other countries. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good point, David. So, you know, if you look at if you look at Germany, for example, there's a mm. huge amount of anti-clerical writing in the late medieval period. Mm. So, you know, people look at the, the misbehaviour of priests and they're scandalised by it, same in England, scandalised by it, writing these polemical, witty, satirical, sarcastic texts to condemn mm. um, clerical misbehaviour. But in Ireland, because Ireland's always had this tradition of married priests, no one's worried if a priest has a wife and children. Mm. Um, you know, e even if it's not a completely regular relationship, according to canon law, it might have been a completely regular relationship according to traditional Irish ways of understanding those relationships. It might have mm. been completely normal. And um, you know, if, if you look at if, if you look at church records in the late medieval period, early 16th century, the church is doing really, really well in Ireland. Mm. You know, mm. no pressure for reform. No, nobody's unhappy with it. Mm. Um, you know, it's striking that. Even in the Augustinian order that Martin Luther was part of, and that's an order that really um, drives, or the personnel of which really drive Protestant Reformation in Europe, even the even the, the Augustinians are, are, are kind of happy with the way that things are. And if, if they have any uh, of the books written by their, their German counterparts, mm. it's really for the purpose of knowing what these people are saying and knowing how to critique it. People can were you, generally happy. Can you describe the relationship between um, Irish Anglicanism and the other strands of Protestantism here? Well, Anglicanism, or the, 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 the Church of Ireland, um, always represents, well, never represents much more than about half of the Protestant population of Ireland. So mm. moving later, 17th into the 18th century, um, you could estimate that around 80% of the population are Catholic, around 10% are dissenters, typically Presbyterian, but there's smaller groups, Quakers, Baptists as well. And then the other, the other group, um, are the are, are the Church of Ireland Anglicans and after the Williamite Wars, so-called Glorious Revolution, the Church of Ireland establishment really takes a grip on Irish institutions and opportunities. They bring in penal laws. Uh, the penal laws are there to make sure that only members of the Church of Ireland can go to university, enter a profession, and become a member of Parliament, and so on and so forth. Those penal laws are applied in different ways. But they're applied both to Protestant dissenters, for example, Presbyterians, and also, obviously, as we know so well, to the great bulk of the population who are Catholics. But the penal laws are not there really designed to convert anybody. Mm. In, in fact, um, one of the penal laws says that any Irish Catholic who, who converts to the Church of Ireland and becomes a lawyer cannot practice at the bar for a certain period of time because there's still a sort of hanging suspicion that the conversion um, might be, you know, to do with financial reasons or something else. But the penal laws are there really to impoverish the middle class, to impoverish landowners. Yeah. And once they do that, once, once land transfers are confirmed, once the mass of the population is impoverished, 
the penal, you know, the penal laws are not really applied anymore. They're never designed to eradicate Catholicism. They're designed to impoverish Catholics. They make the public practice of Catholicism very difficult, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. do the same for Presbyterians. So, for example, a Presbyterian, a Presbyterian minister was unable to marry a Presbyterian to a member of a different denomination until 1844. So only in 1844 were Presbyterian marriages recognised. Mm. Correspondingly, Catholic marriages had always been recognised. So the penal laws apply to different groups in different ways, but they are designed to frustrate, to impoverish, in the case of Presbyterians, to make Presbyterian families have children that are legally illegitimate so that property cannot be passed down to them in, in an easy way. If, if the... Um... If the Reformation hadn't happened and the English and Scottish settlers that arrived here had been Catholic and had remained so, um, would, in the end, those Scottish and Catholic settlers have assimilated in a way they didn't do because of the religious divide? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it's a kind of a hypothetical question, isn't mm. it? We could, look at, we could look at the arrival of the Normans in the 12th century. Mm. And recognise there, I think that um, those th th that invasion was an invasion of Catholics against Catholics, uh, and it demonstrated extraordinary violence by Catholics against Catholics. Mm. Uh, undoubtedly, the the wave of migration that comes in the 16th and 17th century complicates that enormously because uh, there is a confessional sectarian dimension to it. But I mean, I think a, 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 lot, a lot of those wars are not, a lot of the violence there is not really, it's not, it's not justified by religion. Well, it's not, it's not driven by religious causes. It's often driven, for example, the 1641 rising stroke rebellion, however you want to describe it, uh, is, is, is really best understood as a rising of the landless against the new landed orders. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we can see that it's really more about economics in the early stage than about religion. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to prove that is because um, Scottish settlers joined with the Ulster rebels in, in October 1641 against English settlers. Now, as the months continued, it became a much simpler, much more straightforward religious contest. But certainly in the early in the early months of that rising, it was much more complicated than that. And um, you know, we also have evidence, for example, of Irish Catholics joining the Scottish Presbyterian army that invades in 1642, just as they also sometimes joined the army of Oliver Cromwell in 1649 and, and afterwards. So, you know, it, it's, it's tempting, and journalists love to do this, I know, especially in the United States, it's mm. tempting to sort of reduce everything to Protestant versus Catholic. Mm. Sometimes it has been that way, but I think that there are often other kinds of economic or political operators beneath that, uh, and um, but but the, those kinds of tensions are often dressed up as religious tensions, as a an easy way, I suppose, to explain. Yeah, um, because what's happening. yeah, because I guess uh, ethnic tensions can exist even when they share the same faith, and yeah. also social class tensions can exist even when they share the same faith. So I'm afraid that we have all kinds of ways in which we divide ourselves and yeah. then start fighting each other. I mean, that's simply human history. So um, just to fast forward much more to the present, um, there are very strong secularizing forces now at work, sometimes aggressive um, uh, uh, forces, which are kind of beginning uh, to strongly secularize the country. So what do you think is going on there and where will it end up? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, David. I mean. We're all very aware of the weaknesses of, of the institutions of the church. I think that, that that's obvious. We don't need to go over that uh, sad and sometimes terrifying story, mm. except to remind everyone that that's a Protestant story as well as a Catholic story, that the abuses are certainly not limited uh, to, 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 to one denomination. Um, but I think that the, the weakness of the church is... Um, is is or the weakness of the church is being exposed even as a wider culture around it is is much much less supportive of institutions or of the claims of its message, and as a, a much broader cultural movement sweeps across the West. So I think you've got external pressure, uh, which is linked, I think, to the globalization of ideas, 
um, new ways of thinking about what it means to be human. But you've also then got the exposure of weakness within the institutions of Christianity itself. And, you know, it's it's almost like a, a submarine at, at extraordinary depth in some ocean trench. I think it's just, you know, I think we're seeing it just gradually be uh, begin to collapse as a consequence as a consequence of the cultural pressures around it. Um, what's going to happen next, I think, is is going to be really interesting. Uh, the end of the book has got a conclusion that's entirely speculative. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's thinking about it's thinking about current trends and how they might work out. My my own sense is that while there are you know green shoots of growth in some parts uh, of the the, the island, um, I'm thinking particularly of um, the Orthodox churches, which seem to be some of the few churches that are be, that are keeping growing, largely as a consequence, I think, of immigration. Though sometimes also conversion. I think that the, the, the bigger story is likely to be one of continuing cultural pressure against Christianity. Mm. I think, I suspect that the number of people who continue to identify with um, one of the, one, 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 a, a denominational name or to identify as Christians, that number will surely decline and decline until it reaches a kind of a hard core. And in that hard core, will be the people who are willing to commit to this identity, this, this, this faith, this way of life, and irrespective of the cultural forces that are coming in upon them. And I think it's only when we get to that stage that we will be able to say, right, how do we pick ourselves up from this and think about the future? And I, I think that the future that comes after that will be very, very unlike um, the kinds of Christian history that we've been used to. I think it'll be, it'll be a much humbler, much more cautious um, um, kind of religious identity. I suspect also it'll be much less institutional, much more lay-led. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, I think that will be a strength. Um, I think it will also be a movement of people who are driven by what they read in the Bible and what their experience um, of, of um, reading scripture has really taught them about what it means to be Christian and to live as a Christian. I think what you're so talking about, sorry, go on. So it's going to be different, David, I really do think so. Um, I think what you're describing a little bit is what Rod Dreher writes about in the Benedict Auction, these yeah. kind of creative communities and so on um, that have learned to survive as a minority and nourish their faith in a culture that's either indifferent or hostile. And sometimes, yeah. by the way, you know, actively hostile um, in the sense that of wants to teach your children entirely different things to what you want them taught unless you yeah. go for the homeschooling option and even then by the way they might crack down because in some countries that uh, ban homeschooling i noticed in queensland recently very recently they passed a new assisted suicide law that tells um christian um, institutions healthcare centers you must permit assisted suicide on your premises uh, allow an outside doctor to come in and perform it if need be. So we see that they're kind of now not just want to drive us out of the public square, they even want to invade our places and enforce their will and doctrine um, upon us um, in ways that haven't happened before, uh, which puts us in a whole new kind of scenario. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, without that kind of benefit option, we're basically doomed and we're going to have to, in this part of the world at least, um, uh, immigration might have something to say about it, of course, because as you say, um, some of the people coming into this country are from more strongly Christian parts of the world. The West itself is aging and declining, so um, it's not like the West is going to be a dominant force either, in the, and certainly not Europe, in the years to come. But I think we're probably, in order to maintain benefit options, we're going to have to ensure as best we can, which will be very difficult being in a minority, that the law respects our right to worship and practice as we believe. Yeah, I may be less confident than you are, David, that's going to happen. I'm not <laughs> confident, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm maybe less confident. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose I, 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 you know, as I think about the future, I think it's very easy to be pessimistic. Mm. And I think that there are many, many good reasons to be extremely pessimistic. Mm. But then I, I also think about what Jesus says when he speaks to the 12 apostles as he sends them out. And he says, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Mm. And, you know, 
for a long time, it was very hard to believe that Christians in Ireland were part of a little flock. Mm. But once we discovered ourselves to be part of a little flock, I think we were able to take our eyes off our own strength or the strengths of our own institutions mm. and instead look to the one who is the good shepherd of the little mm. flock who promises us that is his father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. No one can take it from us. It's his to give and he intends to do so. Well, thank you, Crawford. And that's a very, very good and uh, um, relatively upbeat place of us to end the interview. Uh, so I recommend that people buy Crawford's new book, The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland from Oxford University Press. And uh, thank you for your time.